In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Eddie Murphy's light. Okay, not quite the oath fans of the DC superhero Green Lantern are used to, but still, it was almost an accurate one, if famed comic book writer John Byrne is to be believed. According to him, in the 80s, he was approached by Warner Brothers, DC's parent company, to write a comedic Green Lantern movie starring the breakout SNL cast member turned mega movie star, an idea that suggests they had learned little from the response to the Richard Pryor starring Superman 3. The Eddie Murphy project never happened, but it wasn't the end of WB trying to play this popular hero for laughs. For whatever reason, the company seemingly remained fixated on the idea of a Green Lantern comedy, going even further in 2006 when they officially hired former SNL writer and Late Night with Conan O'Brien showrunner and creator of Triumph the Insult Comic Dog, Robert Smigel, to write a pure comedy Green Lantern script. The intended star? Jack Black, still riding high off the surprise success of 2003's School of Rock. Smigel, admittedly, was not a comic book fan, and knew little about the character in his world. But to his credit, he did his due diligence, reading years of Green Lantern comics for research, and ultimately deciding to heavily base his script on the iconic stories Emerald Dawn and Emerald Dawn 2, which tell the origin of human test pilot Hal Jordan, who is recruited to join the interstellar peacekeeping force known as the Green Lantern Corps. However, perhaps knowing that Black was not exactly accurate casting for Jordan, Smigel instead created a brand new character, a lazy, slobby furniture store employee named Judd Plato, who has recently become a minor celebrity thanks to his appearance on a TV game show where contestants must eat increasingly disgusting foods without puking. Thanks to what will later be revealed in the script as villainous manipulation, Plato has chosen over Hal Jordan and several other truly worthy candidates to don the green power ring and become Earth's Green Lantern. And then, needless to say, hijinks ensue. Although Jack Black was initially skeptical about the entire idea, he enjoyed Smigel's first draft enough that he grew truly excited about the project, and began pitching his choices for director to the studio. But less enthusiastic were comic book fans, and specifically Green Lantern fans, who were just starting to see comic book movies given the attention and critical respect they felt they deserved thanks to recent movies like Blade, X-Men, Spider-Man, and Batman Begins, and were none too excited to hear their favorite hero was instead going to be used largely as a cinematic punchline. This concern wasn't helped any when a copy of the script was leaked and reported on online. Fans read about a Green Lantern movie where the hero uses the ring to create a green clone of the woman he has a crush on to give him a lap dance, or an army of small elves to clean his apartment, where much of the first act is dedicated to him using the ring to handle an infestation of mice at his place of work, and where, perhaps most egregiously, he also uses the ring to actually knock a window washer off his elevated platform, just so that he can then save him and impress the aforementioned woman he desires. Even though the story did ultimately get to a small level of character growth and redemption for Plato, fans still had a hard time seeing what they liked about the Green Lantern comics in the script. The online backlash was severe, and the project was quietly axed. In 2008, Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk would kick off the MCU, ushering in a new era of comic book movie supremacy in Hollywood, and Warner Brothers, eager to cash in, would once again return to Green Lantern. And while they would cast another actor known primarily for comedy, the project nevertheless dropped the broad comedy approach of the Jack Black version, and instead tried to present a more straightforward, accurate adaptation of the comics. And yet, today, the film is considered something of a laughingstock in the eyes of many comic fans, and its star. The question is, does it deserve that reputation? The year is 2011, and Warner Brothers are looking to launch the next big sci-fi space adventure superhero franchise with Green Lantern. Hello, listeners. You've heard of the DCEU. Well, get ready for Failure to Franchise presents the DCPU. Oh my god, open up a window. Jesus, light a match. Welcome once again to Failure to Franchise, the show dedicated to some of Hollywood's most infamous mistakes, missteps, and misfires. This is Trev. And I'm Chris, 
And in brightest day, in blackest night, no failed franchise shall escape our sight. Let those who worship box office might. <laughs> well, beware our power. F2F's light. Yeah. yeah. They can worship that box office might all they want. <laughs> but that doesn't mean <laughs> it's going to happen. No. no. Uh, so if we are continuing along with the, the DCPU. Mm-hmm. Chris, but also, more importantly to me, this is our Halloween episode. This is our this is our Halloween oh, spectacular. Technically, no. I don't know if you thought about that. No, no. Please. And I mean, I think that I think that's apropos. You know, normally, obviously, for a Halloween episode, I would we would, we would want to do a horror movie. I'd say this is a horror movie of sorts. <laughs> uh, one of the scariest theatrical experiences I've had. But yeah, I'll yeah. talk about that. And not to give away the ghost. Ooh, ghost, spooky. Nice, uh, nice, but not yeah, but um, not to give away too much of how I feel. But I mean, th- I think you already knew, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but that the movie we are doing as we continue our decade by decade look at failed DC superhero franchise starters is we're finally into the 2010s with 2011's Green Lantern. Chris, tell us about this one. Yes, it is. Oh, another way, another thing. A Green Jack O' Lantern. Oh yes, yes. Right. In front Let's of see us. how many we can do here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this is directed by Martin Campbell, uh, who was seminal in launching Pierce Brosnan's Bond in Goldeneye and Daniel Craig's Bond in Casino Royale. Uh, very ironic that he launched both of those uh, brand new franchises uh, with those new leads, and this one crashed and burned. Yeah, um, technically, I guess you could say he also launched the, the Zorro franchise, even though that only got one sequel and it took a long time. Oh yeah, yeah, but, you're right. But he also directed the excellent Mask of Zorro. So. Yeah. That was a great movie great movie yeah love it um especially Catherine zeta jones iconic mm. uh written by greg berlanti uh he is a teen tv show super producer and writer dawson's creek everwood riverdale uh the current dc shows or, or i guess i don't know if current because some of them are done but you know arrow the flash supergirl yeah the arrow uh, he's the Arrowverse guy yeah yeah yep. uh also written by michael green producer and writer of Smallville and Heroes. He wrote Logan, Blade Runner 2049. Uh, Then this was written by Mark Guggenheim, a producer and writer for Law & Order, uh, CSI Miami. Uh, He wrote X-Men Origins Wolverine, the video game. And then... Isn't Isn't that infamously bad video game? Actually, no. That's actually an infamously good video game. Okay, I thought. Yeah, yeah okay, that's the yeah. Yeah, it's actually for I, an infamously I, bad movie. Okay, correct. The movie sucks, but the 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 video game is like really hard R, and it's extremely violent. Uh, and okay. it's kind of the first original incarnation of what the movie should have been. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the video game's good. Right. Uh, and then finally, <laughs> another uh, writer, Michael Goldenberg. He wrote Contact, uh, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And uh, no other credits after Green Lantern. <laughs> <laughs> the budget of the film, $200 million. Domestically, it made $116.6 million. And then worldwide, it made $237 million. So this was quite the disaster on the financial side. Yeah, and not only that, but I think, you know, we've done a few movies like this. Like, obviously, we've been going for a while now. Mm-hmm. And we've looked at, you know, nothing but failures in, in one sense or another. But this is one of those ones, and Chris, I, I would assume you would have to agree, that was kind of like an instantaneous joke. Yeah. You know, like this was like, sometimes it takes a while. Like, you know, okay, for instance, our last episode of Superman Returns, that movie did well enough that for a while people were like, I don't know, I think there's going to be a sequel. You know, we talked about that last time, how there was like mm-hmm. some back and forth on that for a bit. And there was like some, people weren't sure what was going to happen with it. This is one that basically we were about two or three weeks out from release and it's become a punchline and people <laughs> yeah. are like this movie sucks this is not going to be a franchise you know it just this is this was one of those like kind of instant collapses and has remained well i'm sure we'll talk about this it's remained a hollywood punchline this mm-hmm. is a, this is a more infamous bomb and more infamous movie than some of the other failures we've looked at hell even ryan reynolds is open in his disdain for this film Ryan Reynolds uh, just like won't shut up about this movie. I'm sure. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that. Ryan Reynolds won't shut up. Period. Uh, yes. <laughs> Canada's own Ryan Reynolds. Canada's own. And and don't get me wrong. I Does have, he have a heritage of... minute. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in 50 years, yeah. <laughs> we'll do it. But maybe that's a good place to start. Um, let's talk a little bit about Ryan Reynolds. Maybe off the bat here. Mm. Um, what are your feelings on Ryan? I kind of want to talk about a pre. Uh, Deadpool Ryan Reynolds and then a post Deadpool Ryan Reynolds. I think they are very distinct. So uh, I'll I'll let you take it from there. But I I, I want to get your opinion on that uh, uh, that theory. I am on record. I know. Okay, so here we go. I know Ryan Reynolds is beloved. I know he's like one of those ultimate like nice guy celebrities that nobody has a bad word to say about. 
I know people think he's very funny. I know he's handsome. He's talented. Yada, yada, yada. I am long on record as not being a Ryan Reynolds fan. Now, that's not to say I've never enjoyed him in anything. And if you want to talk about, like, pre and post, I agree that they're different. But I think the only difference to me is that the post-Deadpool Ryan Reynolds, I just look at him and go, okay, now he's actually got one role that I think he's good at. Mm. <laughs> like, there's no denying. he Like, Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool is one of those – it is a um, – Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man, Christopher Reeves, Superman, sure. uh, Gal Gadot, Wonder Woman. You know, we talk about like those moments where like the right performer meets the right character and it's just undeniable. Mm-hmm. He is absolutely perfect casting for Deadpool. Why? Because Deadpool is an annoying as fuck sarcastic guy who everyone <laughs> wants to shut up. <laughs> and that's what Ryan Reynolds is. And he's perfect. And so like Ryan Reynolds' whole shtick has just like never done it for me. I mm-hmm. did not. I mean, I like hated Van Wilder when it came out. Um, you know, I didn't like him in waiting. I've just always kind of found him annoying and like, and then there was times where he would try to do like a little bit more dramatic stuff and I'd be like, okay, you know, like I don't like the movie smoking aces, but I remember thinking like, oh, he's trying a little bit more in this, but he never won me over to like a really big degree. And then even though it's not his fault, there was the whole first take a Deadpool in, in Wolverine origins. Right. So Mm -hmm. that had like a stink on it too. Um, so yeah, I, I don't We'll talk more about this as we go on, but I think the problem with Ryan Reynolds is, and this isn't always a a problem, but with him, it just gets to be more. He can only play Ryan Reynolds, basically. Like, he is the same persona in every movie, and that's certainly a factor in how I feel about this film. Um, So I think Deadpool is, like, perfect, and I hope he continues to play Deadpool. I think that's great. But anything else, I'm like, nah, no thank you. Just not not my guy, unfortunately. I'm sure he's nice, like as everyone says, but I'm not a fan of him as a performer. Right. I guess, uh, you know, there, there's a little bit of an age difference between us. So me growing up in high school, uh, you know, Ryan Reynolds was kind of like the fun uh, romantic comedy guy, you know, mm-hmm. on a lot of things. Uh, and I think I liked him then a lot more. Uh, and uh, me and my friends did as well. And he, he, he felt like the actor that Hollywood was always trying to make happen, you know, and to, to a certain degree. And it never really worked until Deadpool, which is funny. You know, they, they tried to get him in these big movies. They tried to get him in X-Men. They tried to get him in Green Lantern here. And it just never really took off. He was always the guy that it's like, yeah, we're trying to make happen, but it's just never, ever, ever happening. And I think you're right in that what Deadpool has shown and subsequently, every single movie that's come out after it is Ryan Reynolds is just playing Ryan Reynolds now. Um, mm-hmm. You argue that he's been doing it the whole time, which I, I guess there is some credit to it. But maybe now, because he's he's on such an international world scale, you just can't escape the guy. <laughs> yeah. Like, like no wonder him and The Rock have become kind of friends. You know what I mean? Like, they both seem like people that are always just playing themselves. I think The Rock is insufferable. I think The Rock, and we're going to get to him in the next episode, but uh, The the Rock is on another scale of just like ego. Uh, I feel like uh, Ryan's uh, Canadian has kept him grounded a little bit. (laughs) So he's, he's less, he's less a fucking dickhole. You know what I mean? Um, I think Ryan Reynolds is a fun presence and I do like him. I like, I think I like him, the celebrity more than I like the actor. Does that make any sense? I guess. I mean, do you agree? Like, he strikes me as the kind of person, and I think it's like, this is the Van Wilder thing, right? Or the, like, the, or like waiting, or even like how, to me, annoying he is in Blade Trinity. But mm, he's yeah, like yeah. the guy who you're at a party and comes into the party and thinks he's really funny, right? And just wa- was trying so hard to make himself the life of the party. And, at a certain, and everyone's like into it for a bit. And then about half an hour, 45 <laughs> minutes, hour in, everyone's like, can this guy just like drop it already? And, like That's what Ryan Reynolds is to me. But he's never dropped it. He's been doing this since like the early 2000s. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, he's just a little bit too, it's just too much for me. It's always too much for me. Sure, sure. So Green Lantern, the character uh-huh. that he gets to play here, is Green Lantern too much for you? What is your history with this character? Because my history is like nothing. I'll just get that out of the way. It's it's nothing. I I, I saw this movie uh, specifically in 2011. Uh, haven't watched it since this uh, this recording. But uh, that is my knowledge of the character. Is that's it? No, I don't. I didn't. I couldn't remember if you knew this about me, Chris. And I can't remember like if it's come up in previous episodes or not. And I swear I'm not doing a bit because it's not like a thing where I'm just trying to like 
overly connect to all of these because <laughs> um, we talked last episode about how much I love Superman too. Sure. But honestly, like there was a period where if you had asked me, I would have said my favorite DC character is Green Lantern or my mm. favorite like DC property. Um, if you could like time travel back into the my bedroom at my, at my uh, parents' old place, you know, not surprisingly, I'm a, I'm a white dude who hosts a movie podcast. Not surprisingly, my room was full of collectibles and charge keys and everything. And like what you you wouldn't you wouldn't see a lot of Batman or Spider Man statues in my room, but you would see a Hal Jordan statue on my on my DVD shelves, along with a Green Lantern Pez dispenser, <laughs> a little Hal Jordan plushie, um, a couple smaller Green Lantern figurines, uh, a Green Lantern ring that I have that I have like you know in a little box on the desk there. A, cris- I, uh, a, a, a crispy Green Lantern sock? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> okay. I, we'll save that for the Blake Lively talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and oddly enough the hector hammond talk no i'm just kidding um <laughs> yeah, i mean he does look like a giant testicle so yeah <laughs> but no i i i love green lantern but i will what i will say is and that's why this actually does tie into this movie where that intense fandom comes from like i always look i told you before i started reading comics very young and i there was a period when i was like in like 10 to like you know, 15, 16, where I was just kind of buying any like random comics. I, mm-hmm. I kind of like just bought anything that I could. So I knew like all the heroes. Um, and at that point, the only ones I was like super into to the point where I'd call myself a, a real fan was X-Men. You know, it's always been like my main go-to. Sure, sure. And, like everything else is just like, yeah, I like them all, you know. But I think you know this just from the research. Uh, in 2004, the writer Jeff Johns takes over Green Lantern. Uh, with a book called Green Lantern Rebirth. And so the version of Green Lantern that, well, I guess let's, should we just say like the general idea of Green Lantern, just so I can set this context here. Sure, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Is that in the DC universe, there's not just one hero named Green Lantern. Instead, Green Lantern is like a title. It's actually like a job almost. The Green Lantern Corps are an intergalactic peacekeeping corps. They're basically like, um, you know, intergalactic police. With every sector of the galaxy given one or two Green Lanterns, depending on when you're reading the book, uh, to patrol it. And so all these different alien races, you know, the rings will seek out and choose uh, a candidate who is the perfect representation of the Green Lantern's values and has no fear. And so the the main, the, the most famous Green Lantern in the comics is Hal Jordan, which is the version that Ron Reynolds plays here. But we, you know, just as I talked about the, the death of Superman thing in a previous episode, every character goes through periods where their sales go down, people get bored with them. Right. And that was happening with Hal Jordan in the 90s. Uh, DC was just like, I don't know, this this version of Green Lantern is getting a little long in the tooth. People aren't as interested anymore. So they actually used the death of Superman story to set up his, like, taking him out too in one of the things that happens in death of superman is cyborg superman the most villainous of the superman replacements uh works with a villain named mongol and they blow up coast city they destroy coast city which is green lantern's home city Mm. murder millions of people right or thousands of people i don't don't know what the number is (laughs) but that event drives hal jordan insane and hal jordan like goes nuts and decide and like takes out the rest of the green lantern Corps. there's like a really iconic cover where he's like murdered all the other green lanterns and he's wearing all the rings on his fingers mm. and, he, and he becomes a villain he becomes a villain named parallax we'll talk about this more and uh he becomes like one of the biggest villains in dc uh he is eventually killed and the ring goes on to a different character named Kyle Rayner. And so for years, Kyle Rayner is the, the main Green Lantern. And I'm not I'm not a big Kyle Rayner guy. There are people who are huge into Kyle Rayner. It probably all depends when you start reading the book, right? Right. During that time, they decide to bring Hal Jordan back, not as Green Lantern, but he comes back as a different DC character called the Spectre. So he's like this, like, he's a ghost figure, essentially, that doles out justice. So anyways, to finally get to my point, in 2004, Jeff Johns, a writer actually from Michigan, where I'm from, uh, comes on and takes over Green Lantern with a book called Rebirth, which is the book that re- that returns Hal Jordan to his Green Lantern role. Right. Um, and it's a really it's a really big book, a big event, critically acclaimed. I read it, love it, and that sets up a multi year run of Jeff Johns writing Green Lantern. And you can look this up. I'm not the only person who says this, but I think to me, Jeff Johns' run on Green Lantern, which I think goes from 2004 to about. I can't remember if it was 2011 or 2012 when he stops. I think he stops not too long after this movie. But that might be my favorite single run of a creative on a superhero book ever. Oh, wow. Because what he does is he takes Green Lantern and he turns it from just a superhero book into this gigantic uh, mythological space epic opera. 
he's the guy that introduces the, all the ideas of like the different cores. So there's not just the green lanterns. There's also like the blue lanterns and the pink lanterns and the orange lanterns and the red lanterns. That's something he creates. He comes up with the idea of there being like two lanterns for each sector. Um, he invents just so much more than mythology. And it's like really from his beginning to his end, you can read the whole thing as like one long continuous story. And although it's like many arcs that comprise it, he's telling this like long epic story that gets into not just the return of Hal Jordan, but Hal Jordan learning so much about the actual histories of the Green Lanterns and the Guardians. Right. And it's just fantastic. So, I mean, that's still running when this movie comes out. So you have to imagine my fandom for Green Lantern is at its height <laughs> in 2011. And I, and, I, and I think, honestly, this movie happens because of that run, too. Yeah. Like, that run, during that run, everybody went to any comic book store and you could talk to anybody. Green Lantern was considered, the like, one of DC's biggest characters. He was right up there with Batman and Superman because Jeff Johns had revolutionized it that much. So that's when I became, like, a huge hardcore fan. And I've remained so. I mean, I don't read it as much since Johns left, but I've certainly kept up with it for the most part, and I still check out the new stories. And so, yeah, to make to, – I know, typical Trevor Long-winded <laughs> question, but yes, I love this character. It's actually one of my favorite DC characters. I'm a huge Green Lantern fan. So there you go. It's pretty interesting that Jeff Johns, like, just isn't involved with this movie, you know? Like, especially in the midst of production. Like, this, we're going to talk about it right now. Like, just kind of, you know, the the iterations that this took. It goes all the way back to 1997 uh, and then finally hits theaters in 2011. And it's just, this is an odd time for superhero movies. It's not like where mm-hmm. we are now, right? With the Marvel method and the MCU, especially in the beginning from 2008 until, well, really the Infinity Saga, I would say. Um, they incorporate a lot of the comic book writers in the process yeah. where Warner Brothers just like never did that, um, which always was, is, well, it has been frustrating. There's a reason why we're looking at this theme <laughs> over the last few months. Uh, Warner Brothers has been very frustrating with their uh, their total grip on the DC Comics universe and fumbling it at every turn. So do you know before we, you know, jump into a little bit of the backstory, do you know why, like, Jeff Johns, like, wasn't a part of this movie at all? Is it, is it well, just because of what I just said? Like, they don't give a shit? I mean, I, his involvement in this movie is is hard to figure out. Like, I, I think, I don't know if it's, like, negligible or what, because he's involved in, to some degree. He is listed as a producer. Yeah. And I do, like, and obviously a lot of the story elements of this movie are taken from his run. Because he did, like, one of the things he did during his run was he did a book called uh, Green Lantern's Secret Origin, mm-hmm. which went back and kind of, like, retconned Hal Jordan's origin. And a lot of that, like, a lot of the elements he created are in this movie. Right. And, like, so a lot of this is coming from what he did with this, you know, character. And even, like, he kind of reconceptualized what Parallax was. And the idea he came up with for Parallax feeds into this movie. Because originally, the original writers were just like, uh, Hal Jordan went crazy and became a guy called Parallax. And Jeff John's like, well, hold on, I have a different answer to that, you know? Interesting. Okay. And one of the things people always made fun of with Green Lantern, which this movie doesn't actually address, but if you go back and read like old Green Lantern comics, the idea was always that, yeah, so if you're a Green Lantern, you have this green like energy ring that you can, with your mind, you can construct anything you want. But their one weakness was yellow, just the color yellow. If a bad guy was dressed completely in yellow, Green Lantern basically couldn't do anything, you know? And people always made fun of that. It was like, it was a silly idea. It was the kind of silly idea you'd see in com- like really old comic books. And Jeff Johns came on and said, I'm finally going to answer that. I'm going to answer why that's the case. So he comes up with this idea that, oh, it turns out that there is actually a manifestation of like fear. And like fear is like the fear on the spectrum, on the color spectrum, every emotion has a different color. And there's a creature called Parallax, who is like the demonic manifestation of fear. The Guardians had captured him long ago, and they were holding him hostage or holding him captive, I should say in the central lantern that they keep on their planet on Oa, right. which charges all the other Green Lantern's rings. And so that's why they're powerless against yellow, because just a little bit of parallax in everyone's ring. So anyways, like they're using all those elements in this movie, as we'll talk about. And John's is listed as producer, and then I remember being at Comic-Con the year before this movie came out, and I saw the panel for this movie. And John's was at that panel. So oh, DC was definitely DC was definitely using him as like the mouthpiece for this movie, which made sense at the time because at that time, if you were a comic fan, you heard Green Lantern, you thought Jeff Johns. So I don't know. I don't it's hard to say how involved he was with this, because certainly he's in the special features for this, I'm pretty sure. Like the featurettes about it. Mm-hmm. He was like promoting it. Um he was really gung ho about it, I remember. Like I remember I, I was already kind of nervous about this movie, and I remember actually being kind of convinced that maybe I would dig it and be into it from that panel because of his enthusiasm. And then Jeff, uh, you know, I think uh, when this property started moving forward toward Hollywood at different points, we heard a lot of different ways that the movie might have ended up talking about some of the past projects. Um, And then uh, 
As far as, as you're involved, tell me, how did you feel when you heard about some of the other ideas, like Green Lantern as a comedy, or maybe some of the other things? Well, one of the very first, when I first worked for Richard Donner, one of the first things um, we talked about was Green Lantern, and that was uh, about 10 years ago, and somebody, at, and one of the executives who's no longer there said, can we do the movie without the ring? And, uh, and right then I thought, there's never going to be a Green Lantern movie. Uh, so, 10 years later, to see it evolve and, you know, uh, maybe misinterpreted as a comedy at one point, and to get to hear and see someone like Martin Campbell and the cast here um, tackle Green Lantern with the respect and the power, it's a dream come true. So, why he didn't write it or anything? I don't know. Maybe it was just he... Like you said, at this time, there was a little bit more of a disconnect between the movies and the comics. And right. maybe they weren't ready to give a comic guy that level of cr control. We do know that after this, Jeff Johns becomes much more of a player in like the DC film side. Yeah. yeah. To a degree that ultimately makes him like a much more controversial figure than he used to be, obviously. For sure. Like today, sure. today is definitely more controversial. Yeah. So 1997, Warner Brothers gets the ball rolling on Green Lantern, uh, the, the cinematic debut. And they go to Trev's favorite filmmaker, Kevin Smith. 37. My girlfriend sucked 37 dicks. In a row? And uh, <laughs> who had just finished writing uh, the, the uh, infamous script for Superman Lives. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim Burton's uh, unmade film with Nick Cage and a giant spider and whatnot. Uh, Kevin Smith turns it down. And then they go to Quentin Tarantino. Why you try to fuck him like a bitch, Brett? I didn't. Yes, you did. And they offer him to do the do the movie. Do you know that was Tarantino ever like uh, outspoken about this character in general? Like, is there a reason why they went to him, or is it just because he's one of those uh, late '90s uh, Miramax guys? Yeah, I don't know if he's outspoken about this character. He was definitely us. Like, he was definitely a, a huge comic book fan in general growing mm -hmm. up. And he talked about that a lot in his like early interviews. He he's, he seems he's one of those guys who seems to know a lot about like every superhero because he's just one of those guys. He like absorbs information, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can tell from he's got that whole like Superman speech in Kill Bill. So he has like, and then he has like the silver. There's the Silver Surfer discussion in um, Crimson Tide that came from his rewrites. So okay. he's one of those guys who has like takes on superheroes, you know. And they were probably just thinking, if there's ever a time where we're, Quentin Tarantino was going to do a comic book movie, it was, like, right then, right? Totally. Coming off of Pulp Fiction. It's like, before he, be, before he really becomes the brand Quentin Tarantino, maybe we can absorb him into the Hollywood machine. So yeah. that's probably went to him at this point. But I doubt he ever really – I think by that point he was already starting to realize, I'm just going to do my own thing here, you know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, then Warner Brothers decides to try to make this an action comedy. Uh, in 2004, they approach Robert Smigel <laughs> to create a, a script for this. Uh, Jack Black is set to maybe be the lead. Uh, very odd, in my opinion, that Chris, whole I, idea. I, ha I have this script. Do you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Guess what? It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really bad. How did you get it? Do you? I know you sometimes have friends that can get you. Oh no, things, no, it's not like a lot. It. It, that's that's a very easy one to find online. You know, oh, okay. a lot of these like un, like unmade scripts just end up online, and that's not a hard one to track down at all. And I have a copy of it. And actually, for a while, I was writing reviews of unmade superhero film scripts for a friend's uh, like publication he was doing. Right, and that was one of the ones I read and uh, wrote the review. And uh, my <laughs> review basically was can be summarized again as, uh, "Thank God this didn't happen." <laughs> Like, did, did like you, I love Jack Black. I like the, I get the idea of it, but it is a movie that seems to really be. You can like Robert Smigel definitely seems to be mocking Green Lantern. You know, okay, like it's a movie yeah. making fun of the idea of the character and using Jack Black as like the avatar of that. So right. it would have been it would have it would have been even more arguably to me it would have set this character back even more than the movie we got did. Mm, okay. I think I don't know that it would have been a, but like the public would have been able to recover from this movie. <laughs> you know, I think it just would have made, made even more of a joke. Uh, so they move on from that. Uh, they go to actor writer Corey Reynolds. Um, I tried to look him up on IMDb, and I did, and he just doesn't ring a bell to me. He just seems like he's just a working actor. Uh, mm -hmm. But he had a take on the John Stewart uh, yeah. Green Lantern character, not the host of the Daily Show. Yeah, good, yeah, good call. John, say that. John Stewart is another. <laughs> John Stewart is is the um, the the Black Green Lantern that is also awesome and like honestly should have been 
Yeah, it should be in the movies already. <laughs> sure, <laughs> again, sure. yeah. But he actually finished the script, and it was called Green Lantern: Birth of a Hero. Uh, it was done in the middle of 2007, and then Warner Brothers sets a release date for 2010, and then just decides to junk it and go to Greg Berlanti to write the new script and direct the film. Uh, this is funny to me because by 2008, that group of writers that I mentioned in the beginning have three drafts of the script done. They're going for a 2011 uh, release date, as I said, and Berlanti is fired. But then they go to Martin Campbell. Uh, why Martin Campbell? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> he is not a superhero guy, but he has launched, as I said, a couple of Bonds, and yeah, he I has an it, eye I for think... action, and he can maybe, you know... Uh, Get this made. Let's just say that. I think that's it, right? You look at, like, you know, 95, he does Goldeneye. 98, he does Mask of Zorro. Um, exactly. You know, 2006, he does Casino Royale. So, I mean, like, you know, he's and like I said, this, the Zorro sequel, not as great. There's some other ones in there. It's like, eh, Vertical Limit, Edge of Darkness. Maybe those aren't the huge of hits. Mm-hmm. But I think he's looked at as just very dependable. And the one thing, too, is, like, Goldeneye is not the same tone as uh, Casino Royale. No. Casino Royale is not the same as Mask of Zorro. Um, Mask of Zorro is not the same as Edge of Darkness. He, I think he was looked at as a guy who can kind of genre jump a little mm-hmm. bit, mm-hmm. but just be dependable. Like he, his movies just tended to be like, you know, successful or well-respected. So I, th- I think the thought was just like, this is a guy, this is going to be a big production because of all the special effects, because it's trying to launch a franchise. We just need a guy who'll get in there and do the job. That, I, that was, it was definitely that kind of thinking, you know, and I think yeah. that's probably why they got rid of Berlanti is he was just so untested. You know, totally, totally. The, let's get old dependable in here to handle this. Well, speaking of dependable, they want Ryan Reynolds for the role almost immediately. Um, uh, there was talks uh, of Bradley Cooper, Justin Timberlake, and again, Trev's favorite actor, Jared Leto. Um, favorite uh, Italian-American Jared Leto. <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably going to drop a clip of him being Italian right now. Never confuse shit with cioccolato. They may look the same, but the taste, very different. Trust me, I know. I'd rather see Gucci born than to hand it over to you two bastards. Oh, but, great stuff. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> not, not offensive at all. Uh, that's, and, you don't realize that that's basically what you sound like. People probably thought you just kept talking. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> No, it's me, Paolo. How could you? But we're a family, huh? So yeah, Ryan Reynolds is uh, is is slated to play Hal now, Jordan. And do you know uh, the other big like the huge fan casting at this point too? Do you remember this at all? Like who this... everyone who everyone wanted to play Hal Jordan. I don't know this. Like the fandom was just obsessed with the idea of them getting Nathan Fillion. Oh, this is like, I do know, this is like remember post that. Post Firefly, and everyone's just like, there's like, everyone's like, that guy would be a perfect Hal Jordan. To the point where there was a really famous, like in the early days of YouTube and, and the internet viral videos, uh, someone cut like a Green Lantern trailer using footage from Nathan Fillion projects and, and made like a fake Green Lantern trailer. And everyone's just like, yes, that's got to be the guy. And so uh, when it wasn't him, there was already, I think, it, with a large part of the fandom, just a little bit of resentment. Like, really, you didn't get Nathan Fillion after all that? It's interesting how like to have Green Lantern and then the Uncharted movies that the fans went they wanted Fillion so bad for both of those incarnations and then he doesn't get it. Um, the, he seems to be the guy that people want to be cast in a lot of stuff. Am I am I wrong? Like he's he guy, just seems like, like he, the guy. He's, he's one of those guys, and there's certainly just there's other examples of this. All he has a very devoted fan base that is sure he should be a movie star. But you know who doesn't think he should be a movie star? Hollywood. Yeah, <laughs> like Hollywood yeah. just looks at him, and I think maybe just because he's got a, a more, he's got. I don't. I'm not saying he's not handsome, but he has a very unique look, right? Mm-hmm. He's not like traditionally movie star handsome, I'd say, and he's got like a really goofy demeanor. I think Hollywood is like now nah, he's a TV guy, or if he's a movie guy, he's a mid budget. Like you know, he can lead something like Slither. That's fine. Sure. Um, but we're not putting him in our multi. We're not putting him in Uncharted. We're not putting him in Green Lantern. Hollywood is like always thought of of Nathan Fillion that way it feels like so he can be very successful in stuff like Castle he's obviously great friends with James Gunn so he'll always get into gun projects Mm -hmm. Um, and like well you know maybe by the end of this episode we'll have more to say about him and Green Lantern (laughs) but uh, but yeah just Hollywood doesn't seem ready to give him like the go-ahead to be a a major like headliner star and I love him I think that's too bad but 
he's a hometown hero. He's from my, he's where I am right now. Well, not where I am. Oh, now, he's Canadian. Oh, never mind. He sucks. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling a little, uh, a lot of <laughs> xenophobic or whatever uh, shit coming from you today. <laughs> Don't make me put another heritage minute in this episode, okay? Don't make me do it. I might write one just for you. So, I told you about the basketball one. Yeah, yeah. Cutting <laughs> okay. the hole in the yeah. 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 <laughs> I just assumed those were the only two they made. There was the Joe Schuster one, and there was the basketball guy. <laughs> there was many. There was many. It was uh, very good. So you'll be fighting in France tomorrow, huh? Well, good luck, Captain Colbert. No one you can be sure will take very good care of the bear. You are noting that he's the official mascot of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade? Yes, sir. So long, Winnie. Yeah. You'd be a good girl while I'm gone. Why Winnie, sir? From my hometown, Winnipeg. Oh, Daddy, I just love Winnie. Couldn't we take him home with us? Christopher Robin, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write some stories about Winnie, and Mr. Shepherd here will draw some pictures. Oh, Daddy, let's call him Winnie the Pooh. Why Pooh, son? I don't know, just Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> and that's how a young Canadian soldier's bear inspired four volumes of stories and verse that still sell millions of copies around the world. Um, I don't know, do you want to just jump into the movie proper now and... See how we felt. I'm pretty sure we know how we feel about it, but um, want to get to it? Uh, yeah, why not? Let's not beat around the bush here. Yeah, yeah. The great light has gone out in the universe. Worlds annihilated. Lanterns, we face an unprecedented danger. An enemy powerful enough to destroy entire civilizations. To fight this enemy... The ring chose a human. But I don't need to tell you your duty. Your name? Hal Jordan. The ring chose you. Take it. Speak the oath. Speak the oath. Because everybody knows the oath. I pledge allegiance to a lantern that I got from a dying purple alien. So, this is the chosen human. The ring turns thought into reality. Its limits are only what you can imagine. The sword of human. Remember, your enemy is not gonna play fair. Is that what I think it is? An alien life form, Doctor. The first that mankind has ever encountered. So we're gonna get you well again. I've never felt better in my life. They said they wouldn't have chosen me. If you didn't see something, I don't see it. I see it. You had the ability to overcome fear. Stay here. No problem. If you die, innocent lives will be lost. Your world will be annihilated. Help me save my planet. Fight it. Fight it with me. Brightest day, blackest night. No evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green lanterns, light! An elite intergalactic defense force of peace and justice called the Green Lantern Corps has existed for centuries without human knowledge. But after the death of one of their best lanterns, Aben Sir, his green will-powered ring chooses reckless test pilot Hal Jordan to take his place in the Corps. Reluctant at first, Hal must now defend Earth from the threat of the evil being named Parallax, who is hell-bent on destroying the universe as we know it. Oh, sorry, I spaced out. <laughs> <laughs> uh before i come very in very apt thing. very apt yeah. yeah uh do you want do you want to go first chris since this is another one where like you have less familiarity with the character so i'm interested to hear like what you know what you thought of it as an introduction sure sure um yeah i i remember seeing this in the theater i think i saw it at a uh 
preview screening ones that were like you know the giving away tickets from like a radio station those ones mm-hmm. and i saw this and it uh, it went over like a big thud <laughs> in 2011 and uh it did the exact same thing <laughs> Uh, a few a few days ago when I watched it, it's um, I I don't know if this is like coming coming from a person that doesn't have the backstory that you have to the character, I I think this is just more or less a boring uninteresting origin mm-hmm. movie. I, I I don't know if this deserves the absolute infamous oh my god the worst piece of shit superhero movie we've ever seen label it's had over the last few years or the last decade i guess but because i just think it's boring you know and and we we recently we actually just talked about before recording me and trev just went to go see the not together obviously but we saw the newest exorcist film and you know we came out of it being like okay well the the critics really had their knives out for it and and in a in a way I, i feel like they did for this one too um I'm going to get into details further uh, of like what things maybe I thought were okay, but most of it is bad for sure. But I, I feel like this is just kind of like a wet fart, <laughs> you know, like, a, and especially to, to introduce your Green Lantern movie, it is no surprise that we just never went forward, you know? Um, yeah, I just felt I was just bored. That was more or less what I did. It, it does every cliche we already know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't uh, distinguish Hal Jordan as anybody special. Uh, the ring seeks out the best of us, right? And I'm just like, what? This guy? Like, I, yeah. I, I, that's my biggest problem, I think, with it is just like, this guy's kind of a dick. He's just kind of a jokester, but he also doesn't really want this power anyways through the movie. They kind of make him kind of a, a mopey mope at times, too, which is weird, um, especially for Ryan Reynolds to play that. And I just, uh, I feel find uh, almost on every level is just kind of uh, a thud, you know? And, um, you know, when your villain is a big poop monster, I, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you anymore. He's just a big cloud and a giant testicle of one other character. So, yeah, it's just not good. Like, I, I'm, we're gonna say, I, don't, I don't think we're going to say anything new in this episode, but, yeah, it just, guess what, guys? It, it holds up for being bad. <laughs> There's so many things you just said I, I want to respond to. One of them is that you said that it's strange that today it still has such a like intense like reputation as being so bad. I, I will say a big part of that I think honestly is the fact that Ryan Reynolds won't drop it. Like oh, we mentioned that, and I, yeah. and I, I think like his like constant mocking of it has kept this movie more in the conversation than it otherwise would be. I think it would be. Just, I think it would be just a little bit more forgotten and like written mm-hmm. off today, if not for the fact that he won't stop making jokes about it. Totally. And I'll, I'll have more to say about that later. But yeah, I just wanted to throw that in. Um, but you know, you mentioned too about how it, the, all the cliches and all the tropes and people having their knives out for it when it came out. I think one thing we didn't mention in before the trailer and in our talk about the, you know, the lead up to this film and this film being made, we also, we should always mention this is the, the, this one is, um, made in the throes of the MCU really yes, taking off. Big time. This comes out the year before the Avengers. This comes out one month before, I believe, Captain America, the first Avenger. You know, we've already at this point had Iron Man and Thor and Iron Man 2 and, and uh, Incredible Hulk. So people are now, and this is also obviously post-Dark Knight. Um, yep, but But MCU even more so, right? People's perception of what a superhero movie is, is changing. And I think the biggest mark against Green Lantern when it came out is like, ah, uh, yes, it's bad, but it's the same kind of bad as the 90s and early 2000s superhero movies we just sat through. Totally, totally. Right? Everything about this movie feels, uh, and when it came out, it felt out of time. This did not feel like it stood alongside the MCU, what the MCU was doing with superheroes, or even what DC was doing with something like The Dark Knight. This felt like a relic of the Steel era. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, this, mm-hmm. this felt like it could have been in the same, made at the same time as Steel. Um, so that's like one issue with it. Uh, the other issue is for it to be for a movie like Green Lantern to work, the effects have to be really, really good. A lot of them are not. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of just this is a movie that really lives and dies by its CGI, and the CGI is really iffy throughout. There are multiple scenes that just look like like Ryan Reynolds' head floating into some <laughs> kind of CGI nightmare environment. Yeah. And yeah. that so it's like there's a lot of just like the the design and everything is kind of atrocious. And then, yeah, I mean, you already hit on this too, and you're it's I, I, it's interesting hearing you say it, not knowing the character, but like you can even sense it. There's just something in your DNA that like awakens. Ryan Reynolds is, is horrible casting. 
for yep. this character. Yep. He is not what Hal Jordan should be. Like Hal Jordan is cocky. Hal Jordan can be like abrasive, but Hal Jordan is not a motor mouth, sarcastic goofball frat guy national lampoon character and that's yeah. the only thing ryan reynolds can do and anytime this movie asks ryan reynolds to kind of you know be more dramatic and really go into the seriousness of it there's just something with ryan reynolds where you, you don't buy it you can't and he can't pull that he usually can't pull it off there's one exception i'll talk about later it's brief but it's, i'll talk about it um but yeah so he can't he, he's just not likable he's not mm-hmm. likable as hal jordan and that's that's a huge problem hal jordan is is um he is a flyboy, like cocky. You know, he's, he's Maverick, essentially. And I don't think it's a coincidence that in recent years, people have really wanted to see Tom Cruise play Hal Jordan in the new DC. Like you've, I'm sure you've heard that, too. Yep. Like, yeah, I have. That's been a huge thing. I think that's like the Hal Jordan or uh, Tom Cruise in the Top Gun movies is basically what this character should have been. And unfortunately, Ryan Reynolds is pushing his like comedic side a lot in this movie. And so what I when I walked into this movie... In 2011, I was really hoping, coming off of the Jeff Johns run, or really being in the Jeff Johns run, to see a big kind of space opera epic, uh, the kind of space epic sci-fi movie that Hollywood wasn't really making anymore, you know? And instead, I got a really generic superhero movie yep. with just the barest hints of that space opera stuff. This movie is pretty earthbound for the most part, too. And uh, and when it goes to space, space looks terrible. <laughs> and so and it, and it's uh, all the space stuff is just exposition dumps. Like there's yeah, nothing. It, it's not rooted it, any in any character or drama. It's just let me explain to the viewer because this is so wild in quotation mm-hmm. marks that we have to get general audiences on board. But in doing so. It just becomes a fucking slog. Like yeah. that's the biggest problem. Is just it's it's like I, I agree. Like sorry to cut you off, by the way, but like no, I, no. I, I I agree that like Ryan Reynolds is miscast. But like the script, this is almost entirely a script issue too, because it just feels like everybody is. There's no reasoning for anything, right? Like th- it's hinted later on at the very end of the movie that there is a maybe a love triangle or past history of sorts between Hal Jordan, played by Ryan Reynolds, Carol Ferris, played by Blake Lively, and Hector Hammond, played by Peter Sarsgaard, who's the villain. And it never pulls the trigger on that. Mm-hmm. There, it's hinted at, but we never saw any hint. We never saw anything of it in the beginning. Um, Hal Jordan does not speak to the villain until the final 15 minutes of the movie. And it's just, hey, save her. I'll give you my ring. That's it. And to have your to have your hero to care about your hero dynamic with the villain, they have to talk. <laughs> and there's like one little action scene halfway through the movie, but I clocked it. Hal does not speak to him once. It's fucking crazy. It's crazy. He talks. He actually does talk to him. See, this is the thing that's funny too. Is like this shows how horribly constructed this movie is. He talks to him very briefly at that party where the action scene happens. They have like a, a brief, very brief interaction, but that's that's about it. Because like uh, Hector's, but like not knowing him, like but like not knowing him as a villain though. This is the thing. Like when, when oh he, yeah, he, as the villain, yeah, yeah. Like when 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 Hector Hammond is obviously the villain, and Hal supposedly knows him, right? Mm. He's never like Hector. You're better than this. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Like, like oh, yeah, it's yeah. it's nothing is being said. It's just it's just goes into that punchy punchy CGI stuff. And to go back to your visual thing, like the visuals are bad, but not exactly bad in on a conceptual level. I, I kind of like the idea that his suit is always moving and fluid and lighting and stuff. Ugh. That's pretty. Co- I think no. Hold on, hold on. I'm not saying it's done well, but on yeah. a conceptual level, I can see why they were like, oh, this would be kind of a cool idea. But then just it's just not ready. You know, the CGI is not there. Uh, we have reports that them doing the actual CGI of the suit was done, was done two months before uh, release. So mm-hmm. it looks terrible, but I don't, I don't, I guess I, I, I see where maybe, oh, this could be visually interesting. You know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. all I'm getting at. Yeah, I have something else to say about that suit because it's a really great point. And I, but I'll get to it in a moment. I just wanted to find, finish the story about me seeing this, just because I I, I think it's funny because I mentioned the last episode. I'll tell you about my theatrical experience with this. Oh yeah, yeah. So right. I, told you, I, I went into this at a time where my Green Lantern fandom couldn't have been higher, mm-hmm. and I was not happy about the casting of Ryan Reynolds. But as I said, I went to Comic Con. Jeff Johns kind of talked me into it. Um, <laughs> Ryan Reynolds at, was at that panel as well, and you know what he. Because we just said this, right? He did what Ryan Donalds did, and he came across very likable. Yeah, big time. And I and I was there for the panel, and he did the he had the ring on, 
and he did the oath like for a kid who had like a kid came up and asked a question and Ryan Reynolds did the oath and he kind of like made his voice deeper. Hey, how are you doing? Good. This is a question for Ryan. What does it feel like to oh, say the Green Lantern Oath? <laughs> It sounds a little like this. In brightest day, in blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. But those who worship evil's might, beware my power. Green Lantern's light. Um, so he did the Green Lantern Oath to the kid, and it was like really kind of touching and moving. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then they showed a clip. They showed the clip where Hal Jordan gets attacked by those guys in the alleyway and first uses the ring's power. And it's like it was brief, but I was like, okay, that's a nice visualization of the green, like him making a giant green fist. I walked out of that like, all right, you know what? I'm not going to be a total like pisshead about this. I'm going to go in right. optimistic. I'm going to hope for the best. And my buddy Bird will tell you he sat next to me at this at this screening and he has often talked about every time this movie gets brought up he <laughs> likes to tell people how he's like he's like i just kept looking over at trevor and throughout the movie he just kept sinking lower and lower in his seat <laughs> so that's what happened because yes the movie started and i was like all right let's see what you got movie and by the end of the movie i was almost on the floor just of like like embarrassing you because because it was one of those things where you know you like it was i was probably telling everyone like you don't get it man this is like this is actually the best dc character you know right. like this is the stuff right now and then seeing this movie and just being like, oh god no what what happened you know what went wrong here now, to the point of the suit, uh, yes, I agree with you that the, the general idea, maybe, of the fact that, like, okay, so the ring creates this suit, so if the ring is, you know, creating this green power energy, the the suit can be made of that, and, this, and it can, like, kind of breathe and be alive. It Obviously, as you said, it does look bad, especially the mask. Anytime he's yeah, wearing the mask, it, it just looks atrocious. Like, it's just, it, it, you can almost see, like, the line around it. It never seems like it's, like, actually on his face. Really bad. But someone, and I can't take credit for this. I saw someone else say this. But I've parroted it to many people since because I think there's so much truth to it. I, I'm sure you've seen interviews with character, like actors who have played Superman. Like to a T, all of them, whether it's I've seen Brandon Routh talk about this. I've seen Tyler Hoechlin talk about this. I believe I, I think I even saw Henry Cavill talk about this. They all say that, yes, you can say like the Superman suit is like goofy, you know, in, in like any kind of context outside of, you know, the comics or whatever. Oh, yeah, it's got the red trunks. It's blue spandex and a cape. But they'll say, like, you know what? When I put that costume on and I walked onto set the first time, the way everyone treats you suddenly changes. Like, mm. they look at you and you're Superman. And suddenly you feel that. You feel the power of that suit. And then I saw someone talk about that because they brought up, you know what? Ryan Reynolds never got to wear a Green Lantern costume. Right. Through this entire movie, Ryan Reynolds wore, like, you know, blue spandex with ping pong balls on it. Mm-hmm. So it could be CGI, and it's like, oh, that's actually a really good point. Like, yes, I don't think he's, I don't think he's cast well, and you said like the script is bad, but also, honestly, his performance might have been hampered by the fact that he's wearing a goofy looking CGI like <laughs> template suit the entire time he's making this movie, and he never got to like see himself as the hero, and that you know, people, a lot of actors do say the costume makes your performance, I- and like that's actually interesting to think like, oh yeah, that's that was that could have played into why he never feels like heroic in the suit or, you know, in any of those elements, he wasn't even wearing it. I love that take because it's, uh, it's just reminiscent of just these big CGI productions. Right. And when, uh, you know, especially from a direction or a director standpoint, right. If they're not, you gotta be a really fucking good director to mm-hmm. get your actor on board with the big green and blue screens. You know, we went through this with the prequels of star Wars. Right. And, the CGI suit then in 2011 was something that everybody mocked immediately, right? Mm-hmm. And only now are people starting to mock the MCU for doing that. I, I am on record, and you know this, for my CGI suits uh, has been the bane of my existence with these MCU movies. When they started to get... Re- when they when, when Robert Downey Jr. became too big for his britches and he was just like, you know what? I don't want to wear the suit anymore. They started CGIing him all the time. Mm-hmm. Even Spider-Man. Tom Holland's been CGI'd the whole time now. Uh, you can just you can just see it. You can feel it. You can just tell that these movies are tinkered and, and, and moved around in bits and pieces and all, right up until release. So the CGI suit at least... 
Not, I'm not trying to defend the suit as much, okay? I promise you. But at least in Green Lantern, it was a take, right? At least yeah. it was something that they were like, oh, this is an interesting thing versus, you know, a means to an end. You know what I mean? It was a take, but like you said, like you do lose, like when it's all CGI, that you lose the tactile element that makes these movies really come alive and feel Absolutely. like something. Absolutely. You know, like I said, like I'm talking about how what I want this movie, what what I wish this movie looked like, and the space opera element of it. And we just talked about like the, the the environments, even like Oa, the planet of the the home planet of the Green Lantern Corps, where pretty much all the space scenes take place, is just entirely CGI. So when yeah. you're in those sequences, it looks like the prequels, right? Yep. Now compare that to a, a more like a recent example. Compare that to the giant sets and great, you know, fantastical production design we got in something like Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like if this movie looked like that, it would be it would go a long way towards making the movie more interesting to look at and a much better movie. And but and it just, just instead it just looks like a video game cutscene the whole time. It, it is. I've wrote that in my notes, a PS2 video game cinematic for a lot of it. Yeah. It just doesn't do the actors any favors. Okay. No. Like the moment that Hal Jordan gets ripped in a little ripped out of uh, his uh, neighborhood and flown through the air, you know, to Oa and or or doesn't he go to Abinsur's dead body at that point or whatever? It doesn't matter. Honestly, it doesn't matter. When he when he gets flown to space, <laughs> uh, Ryan Reynolds is barely emoting, right? And he gets to Oa and he's barely emoting. And this is such a problem I have with these big CGI adventure tales when the direction doesn't know what to do. And like you said, this uh, the actor has no attachment to what's going on. That's such, I'm, that's, I'm absolutely going to parrot that as well from now on about not wearing the suit. But mm -hmm. there's just nothing there. <laughs> and it's obvious that there's nothing there. You know, the Green Lanterns are cool because there's a cast of colorful, crazy, weird alien characters that are in the core. And in this movie, they're just a bunch of gobbledygook, right? Yeah. And and uh, Hal doesn't know, like, or I guess Ryan Reynolds doesn't know how to talk to them. You, he, you can tell he's looking at a ball on a stick. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, yeah, even Oa tell, like, just the, looks the, like the, shit. Yeah, and I know like the actors never interact with their surroundings at all never. because they can't because there are no surroundings. So again, not to keep doing this, but to compare it to Guardians Three again, I, a, a scene from Guardians Three just popped into my head. Remember the part where they go to get like the rec like Rocket's records, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the records are in that room, and they that little ball comes down. It's like that little flesh ball, and that's like what the records are in. Yeah, yeah. And like you know, Star Lord picks it up, and it's gross, and he's like poking at it and stuff. And it's like, oh, that's a thing that they made. You know, mm -hmm. like not to say there's no CGI in Gardens. Of course there are, but as we just said, there's a lot of built sets there's a lot of practical stuff you can watch the other guardians in the background a lot of sequences and they're like engaging with the surroundings because they're on yep. sets here you talked about how all the space scenes are just exposition dumps that's because the actors just have to stand there all they mm -hmm. can do is stand and give exposition because they're just in a big blue room and oa is going to be drawn in later so there's never any moment where any of them like pick anything up and look at it or you know like you know, like you could have even had like a joke about like there being a weird chair for an alien race and Hal doesn't know how to sit on it. Yeah. But like yeah. they just don't have any of that. All anyone does is stand on platforms and talk. So the movie becomes really inert. The movie's most inert sequences, oddly enough, are when they're in space and on Oa because they can't do anything. They're just mm -hmm. they're just in a room that's all going to be that's going to be illustrated for them later. It's it's a horrible decision. And why do you set up a magical ring? that your imagination is is endless, right? You can do anything you want with this ring, right? According to the film, the movie says it's your, your you can do whatever you want as long as you're imagine, you can imagine it and it's it's done. This guy <laughs> uses a fist. He makes a race cart like a like a Hot Wheels race car track that seemingly endangers everybody at the party way worse. Um a couple of jet fighters because he's a pilot. Why is he not more imaginative? Like now, now well, I'm looking at Hal Jordan being kind of a bozo in that sense too. Like, open your mind up, do something fun. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even have a problem with that if, if, if the movie treated it as a plot point or as a story element. Yeah, because that is the thing. Like, so this is one of the things I love in the comics too, is there is the idea that once you're a Green Lantern, you, it's, it's whatever your imagination can do, and the constructs are built off of your will and your imagination. But the comics actually make a really big uh, part, like a really big idea out of the fact that not every person's imagination is the same. Yeah. 
So in the comic, there are Green Lanterns who they get the ring and they basically just make fists or whatever, right? Because that's all they know, or big hammers. Because that's mm-hmm. kind of all they know to do. And, and Hal's actually kind of somewhere in the middle. Then you have a character like John Stewart, who we mentioned before, and the, the character John Stewart has an engineering background. Mm-hmm. So they talk about when you see his constructs get made, you can actually his constructs are built from the perspective of an engineer. Like he has gears and stuff in his. He's constructs. putting, he's putting he can, villains in saw traps. <laughs> well, he can instantly think of that kind of stuff, and I love that. I love that notion of detail, right? So that would have been really cool if in this movie where we were watching Hal learn how to use the ring like what totally. isn't that what this way should be mm-hmm. like shouldn't we see his constructs get better and better as the movie goes along but instead he kind of immediately just kind of masters it and also does and also doesn't want it like this yes. is what's so annoying in the movie is that like you're telling me hal jordan who he's a good looking man okay he's got a sick job as a as a pilot he's got a hot girlfriend you know uh he's he has a great life Okay, this guy, the, the movie opens with him having like a one night stand with some bombshell. And then he's rare, like he's rarely joyful with this newfound power at all. You never, he never goes through the motions of like, oh man, this is a fun, cool thing to do. Oh, cool. I can do this now. I can do that. I can, I can make my coffee from the, you know what I mean? Like, why doesn't he do things on an everyday level to enhance the joy of his life? But instead, he kind of becomes a sad sack and just mm-hmm. quits. And I'm like, oh, that's weird because you told me, movie, that uh, Abin Sir uh, tells you that the ring goes to find the best of us. And again, you found Hal Jordan and Hal Jordan doesn't even want to fucking do this job. So it's like, yeah, and then and then they let him quit and then they they let him go back to Earth with the ring. <laughs> <laughs> What's that about? Yes, this you just now you just hit on on a script level. The probably the biggest problem with the movie is that as an origin story, this is telling exactly the wrong kind of story about Hal Jordan. Mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier how I think there's one really brief moment in the movie where I like his, and I don't even know if this is performance. Like you said, this might just be script, but I'll tell you the one moment where I the Hal Jordan I see on screen is the Hal Jordan I know from the comics, and it's before he's even Green Lantern. It's when the ring brings him to Abinser's crashed ship. So Abinser is the previous Green Lantern who's dying. Mm-hmm. And there's the moment where he, the, the ring dumps, dumps him on the beach and he sees the spacecraft and he's just like blown away, obviously, right? Like he's seeing a UFO, a crashed UFO, and he's never seen anything like this. And then he turns just a little bit and he sees Abin Sur in there. And Abin Sur is obviously an alien, so it's like he's kind of freaked out by it. But yeah. then he notices that Abin Sur is injured. And what does he do? He immediately runs up to the ship to help him. Mm-hmm. And that's the one moment in the movie where it's like, oh, yeah, that's how Jordan, like he saw someone hurt. And it didn't matter there was an alien. It didn't matter there was like a pink skinned, you know, creature that he's never seen before. He saw someone who needed help and he just, without any thought of his own safety or without any thought of what's going on, he ran to help that person. Mm -hmm. And that's Hal Jordan. That's why he gets the ring. And then he gets the ring and goes, this sucks. I don't want it. (laughs) It's like, now you can obviously tell stories about Green Lanterns who grow tired of their job or aren't sure they should be heroes. That's a great heroic story. You don't usually do that for the origin. No. That's, that's a, there's a reason Sam Raimi saves that for Spider-Man 2. You yeah. know? Like, yeah. There's a reason that's more of a sequel story. The fact that this origin movie is largely the refusal of the call. <laughs> like, right? Refusal of the call is part of the hero's journey. It shouldn't be 60% of the movie. It's We want to see him doing heroic things. We want to see him learning, as you said, learning to be Green Lantern having, and finding it exciting and having joy to it instead he basically only becomes a hero at the end because he kind of is like fuck i guess i have to right totally. like they he even goes and asks for help and they're all like no and he's like all right i guess i'll do it myself it's like oh uh, this is great and that what, what an exciting hero well and this goes back to um what you had mentioned about the release date right like at this point we've seen the two iron mans we've seen uh, uh thor we've also seen x-men first class and in all these movies these characters are enjoying being a superhero you know like like they're they're fun charismatic characters that you can get on board with you want to see them use the powers you want to see them uh, uh save people uh thor you know i i have my problems with that first movie taking place on one street by 7-eleven but uh you know at least chris hemsworth is just a, a ball of charisma you know that you just can't take your eyes off of him right and he's hilarious and in this movie you just you don't even want to spend time with Hal. There's no call for me as the viewer to give a damn about his journey at all because he just doesn't want to do it. This movie is not. It's so you know we we both hate when it's just when people reductively say oh it's fun or it's not fun, but this movie's just not fun, and mm-hmm. it should be. You have a ring that allows you to do anything that you can put into your mind, and the movie's just not fun, yeah. and that's a huge problem. A huge problem. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, I'll, I'll tell you a moment I always remember from the the, the first Jeff Johns Green Lantern story rebirth. So I remember I, t- I set the context for this a little earlier. For years in DC, Hal had be- Hal had gone insane. He'd killed most of their Green Lanterns. He'd become a villain. Then he'd been killed himself. Then he came back as a different character, like a, the Specter, a, a like a Specter of Justice, this dark supernatural character. And in the meantime, Kyle Rayner becomes the only Green Lantern, right? Because the, the, the all the other Green Lanterns have been killed, so he's the only one now. Mm-hmm. And Rebirth is essentially not only resurrecting Hal Jordan, but resurrecting the Green Lantern Corps. And I'm not going to tell the whole story. People should read it because it's awesome. But there's the moment where finally you get the the scene you've been waiting for, where the ring comes back to Hal Jordan. And we see him in the, the, the Green Lantern suit forms, and he's finally Green Lantern again. And he sees Kyle Rayner. And this is, some, this is someone who like took over his role, right? And Hal Jordan is still confused, not sure what's going on. And the first thing he does is he goes up to Kyle Rayner and goes, okay, let's do this right. Hi, I'm Hal. And he, hands out his, he puts out his hand to shake his hand and instantly accepts him. And it's just mm-hmm. like, you know what? You're wearing a Green Lantern ring. I'm a Green Lantern. You must be a good guy. I'm a good guy. Let's go fight evil together. And it's like, yes, that's the hero. That's the heroic character we love, right? And in this movie, he's just like, like you said, he's Mopey McMoperson, who just yeah. like, <laughs> hates this responsibility he's been given. Um, and like you said, like there could be a lot of good comedy in this movie. I think there is humor to be found in someone getting this ring. You know, I don't want the Jack Black movie, sure. but a couple montages of him using the ring in different ways and failing or, you know, and like I said, trying to do like more and more uh, impressive constructs and, you know, learning the ropes. Yes. And this movie just like plows through all that just to have more scenes where he's like going to his girlfriend and going like, I don't know if I can do this. You know, it's <laughs> like, Oh man, what is this movie? Yeah. It's uh, it, it's again, it just becomes a bore because you're watching a character that's boring. Um, mm-hmm. Even in his own life. Uh, okay. Uh, did you realize before Peter Sarsgaard becomes a giant testicle? Did you realize that I, I put this two together? I know he's not related to them because they have different names, but the names are so similar, but Peter Sarsgaard, looks like a makeupless uh, uh, Pennywise. <laughs> but before Bill Skarsgård played the role. And and I, I it was just, I found it, he's just constantly screaming in the movie. Yeah. That's all he does. He just screams. And it's like this really annoying scream too. Like I, I'm, I'll probably place a few here. But it's annoying. <laughs> it's just, and, and that's his character is that like he screams. He doesn't like his dad. Um... Even though his dad is giving him a job, you know, he doesn't maybe respect his kid, but at least he's trying to help the guy out. <laughs> you know, it's mm-hmm. it's just a very strange situation. Like, you know, sometimes you can love your family. It doesn't mean you always have to like them, you know? And uh, I just found their relationship, did it what, did it have to go so evil so quick? I, I didn't really get it. And then the well, it got Hector connection evil juice. Occur- Right, the evil juice. I forgot. I forgot yeah. about the evil juice. <laughs> um, and like his... his uh, connection to carol played by blake lively that he maybe has the hots for her but i mean who wouldn't because it's blake lively so it's like well i need more than that i need more of i need a flashback you know to them Mm. in like college or something um but that even doesn't work out because this is like a mismatch in casting and ages as well did you notice that too like, well, yeah, Tim Robbins uh, plays his dad. He's only 11 years older than Peter Sarsgaard. Yeah, and they they put makeup on Peter Sarsgaard, and he he looks so much older. Yeah. Like, he looks... He, there, there's a way of getting around that. You know, like Indiana Jones, right? Like, Sean Connery and Harrison Ford were basically the same age in that movie. But you know what? Uh, they made Sean Connery look old and act mm-hmm. old. And in this movie, uh, they look like contemporaries. Like, it just it just doesn't make any sense. They could be brothers. Um, so if you did do, like, a, a flashback... I think you'd have to do some serious adjustments because it just really doesn't work. It really doesn't yeah. work. Um, but also, we don't care about that triangle enough to even want to see those flashbacks. You know what I mean? So sure. It's like yeah, you're right. The movie, the, right. the movie's just doomed in that element from yeah. the beginning. This is this is a big problem. Another not the problem, but another big problem with the movie is just the villain, right? Like, why is it not Sinestro? Like. Mark Strong, famous villain Mark Strong is in this movie, Mm -hmm. giving the best performance of the movie, I I, I think, and uh, probably the best interpretation of the character that he's trying to play. I'm going to ask you with a question mark. Um, But, you know, he's good at playing a villain. And when Mark Strong is cast in a movie, you know what? You know he's going to be the villain. Why not make Sinestro the villain and be kind of the, you know, the other side to the coin of Green Lantern in this? Why, Why did they not do this? It's right in front of them the whole movie. 
I, I have a different take on that. All right, because like so, Sinestro is Hal Jordan's main villain mm-hmm. um, in the in the comics. But there's like a lot of backstory there, and I think if you want to see a good version of what you're asking for, a few years before this, the DC did an animated film called Green Lantern First Flight. Okay, that is really good. I believe I could be wrong. Don't hold me to this. I think Nathan Fillion actually is the voice of Hal in that. Um, but that's like a, an origin story for Hal Jordan that right away gets to Sinestro being the villain. But so it, that's that's one that, that kind of condenses it. I will say I actually think I have a different take on this because the. The mid credit scene in this movie does set up Sinestro as the villain for the next movie, which, yeah. of course, we never got. And my problem is actually that in the comics, it is true that Sinestro was a Green Lantern. He was actually the best. He was thought of as, like, the best Green Lantern. He was the, uh, he was a, he was a great Green Lantern. And he just, over time, got too, like, uh, obsessed with keeping, like, order and basically took over his own planet. Like, the planet he came from, he enacted, which the Guardians didn't know, he enacted this, like, total police state where he mm-hmm. had complete control. And when they found that out, he was like kicked out of the Guardians or kicked out of the Green Lantern Corps. And he ultimately becomes, you know, starts his own core, the Sinestro Corps with the yellow rings, which this way hints at at the end. What what is interesting in the comics, though, is that during the time he was a Green Lantern, him and Hal were great friends. So there's actually like ever since there's a really great dichotomy between those two characters because they're now they're now villains. But they have this they had this friendship for years yeah Yeah. and there are still times where they have to team up and sometimes they actually are you know because sinestro's bad but he's only bad because he has a different idea in his head of what justice should be you Mm -hmm. know so if a really great evil shows up that's like worse than sinestro sometimes he still will work with hal and like but they but he's still a villain right and that's all that's all great so like actually i don't mind sinestro not being the villain in this movie the problem is that he's not Hal's friend either. Right. He's right. just an asshole to him the whole movie. <laughs> and then and he's an asshole to him the whole movie. And then the mid credit scene, he puts on the ring and we're supposed to go like, oh, no way. He's yeah. going to be the villain. It's like, no, no, no. You screwed this up. If he had been the most sinister of the comics and he'd been Hal's mentor and they had worked together and they were kind of like buddy cops in this movie, then you'd actually get away with the, tw- like the twist at the end of being like, Oh, he might be the villain the next time that would have more impact. So right. I, th- I think it was fine to not have him be the villain in this one, but I think by having him just be a dick, the whole movie, you're missing the point anyways, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but you're right. But just, just really quickly, you are right that he's the best performance by far. He's just pitch perfect as Sinestro. Yeah. 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 So, this is the human. When I learned I've been Sewer's ring had chosen you, I said there had to be a mistake. I see nothing to change my mind. I'll take it from here, Kilowog. The core is only as strong as its weakest link, and I will tolerate no weak links. You understand me? Be you afraid, human? You didn't like uh, Taika Waititi? Oh man, you know, I'm pretty sure this was the first time, like, place I ever saw Taika Waititi, and like, obviously, like, you know, years probably went by before I thought about him again, and just didn't even realize it's that guy from Green Lantern. <laughs> but like, this was interesting, right? Because this is obviously way before the world fell in love with Taika Waititi, and then all decided to hate Taika Waititi. <laughs> <right? laughs> like, both have happened since. But yeah, yeah. Did you? I mean, he he's so he's so like nondescript in this, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, whatever you think of Taika Waititi now, the dude is, like, funny, right? And he's got, like, he's got comedic timing, and this movie doesn't ask him to... I, when he shows up, you're kind of... Now you're like, oh, of course, he's going to be the funny best friend, but he's not. No. Is that an issue with, like, is the problem when when Ryan Reynolds is the hero? Like, why bother having a funny best friend? I don't know. But, like, I don't... I, it's just weird that it even needs Taika Waititi, because he basically just has a few lines, but he does nothing in this movie. He doesn't, like, score any big laughs or anything. He's just there. I, I think it just goes to the thing that this thing was jumbled up you know like this Mm -hmm. is just a complete blender of scenes you know and and i still i still stand by uh that this didn't deserve the 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 crazy vitriol it has uh but it is still barely adequate at times you know what i mean like it's still like it's still a movie like me me and you have watched (laughs) on this podcast and our loyal listeners have heard you know we've watched movies that aren't movies at least this one has, you know, a beginning, middle, and an end. Does it do it bad or poorly? Yeah, but it's still, you know, I can still see the money that they're putting into it. I can see somewhat of the talent behind it. It just seems like fumbling the bag, you know? Mm-hmm. That's how this movie feels. And to your point of before, you're saying, you know, like, Ryan Reynolds won't let this thing go. You're so right that this, this movie has stood the test of time for being a piece of shit. 
because the actor won't shut up about it. You know, he makes fun of it in Deadpool. He makes fun of it in Deadpool 2. He he constantly rags on the movie. And, like, I get it to a point, but, you know, maybe the joke's over now. I, I, I don't know. I Like... They did that whole press run for like, what was, was it like free guy that would take TD yeah. and worked on together. Yeah. And they did the whole press run where they're like, yeah, it was our first time working together. And people would be like, what about green lantern? And like, what? No, we never even heard of that. And it's like, yeah, after like between that and especially the jokes at the end of Deadpool two, where he goes back in time and like kills Ryan Reynolds and stops him <laughs> from making green lantern. Yeah. I don't, I know this is silly. I know that's just a silly joke in a movie, but I will say this. And this, this gets us to the next element I wanted to ask you about. Um, I remember watching that scene and going like, all right, not only do you need to drop this, but also isn't it kind of weird that you're like saying like, I wish I hadn't made that movie where I met my hot ass wife that I'm in love with and have been together with ever since and we have multiple children. <laughs> like, isn't that strange? Like this movie is obviously still a good thing for you. Like no matter what you say, like Green Lantern is net positive for Ryan Reynolds. You know, like he was able to parlay it into a tons of jokes for his career, but also he met his wife. You know. now, yeah, and it didn't, to... it didn't, it didn't derail his career as much as I think people think he did. Like he, he, I'm looking at the movies now, and he still is in a movie a year, maybe two, three movies a year until Deadpool. So it's like he's he's working. He just mm-hmm. isn't Hollywood A list like he does become with Deadpool. So yeah, it's, we've talked many times on this show about how much a movie will completely destroy your career that you're never heard from again. But you're so right that this movie is. It's almost worked out in his favor on on a, yeah. not almost it has it has. I mean, just two years after Green Lantern, they like Hollywood tries to give him another franchise with R.I.P.D., which we'll mm-hmm. look at at some future point. You know, so yeah, this this didn't like it just, this didn't kill his career. No. Now I brought up the Blake Lively thing. I wanted to ask you. The, the, so we know they are deeply in love. They are a very they are a funny couple. I mm-hmm. like on like uh, if you follow them on social media, I love the kind of ongoing joke where. On like Blake Lively's birthday, he'll post like a picture of her, but she's kind of cropped out. It's the two yeah, of yeah. them, and she's kind of cropped out. Like that's a good bit. And she does it back to him and stuff. Um, do you think they have any chemistry in this movie? <laughs> Isn't it like I thought they have like to me? It's just so weird. They have like no chemistry on screen, and it's just strange to think that they were watching as they actually, they honestly were falling in love behind the scenes. But man, mm-hmm. does not, it not translate on screen at all? In my opinion, it, it doesn't. And and I yeah. I think it's funny when we talk about movies like this, and we always ask, you know. Isn't it weird that they don't have chemistry or they do have chemistry? I think this just kind of proves that, I mean, sometimes if the actor isn't in love with the material, then they're not even going to try. You know what I mean? Like, like. Well, it made me wonder, was this really a case? Like, I don't know. I don't want to, like, obviously I have no idea. But did they just look at each other one day on set and go, you know what? You're super attractive. I'm super attractive. Maybe we should just do this. <laughs> like, was that the beginning <laughs> of the relationship? I mean... Yeah, I usually that's what I say with these movies we talk about. Like they're two incredibly hot people, and obviously Ryan has charisma in regular life, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, he's kind of you know he's kind of the whole package a lot of the time, and you know Blake Lively's beautiful. She always has been. So uh, there's no surprise in, in mm-hmm. that they got together. Um, but the translating thing to answer your question is uh, no. <laughs> it, it does not translate at all it doesn't seem like they're this long lost love i will say that i did like the joke or moment when he goes to her bedroom and he's oh, yeah. dressed up as green lantern and she just immediately says oh my god this is how how what are you doing yeah and yeah i, I like that that was a good that's move. great because it's the moment you've been waiting for in every superhero movie yes, yes right like finally for them to acknowledge like yeah you can't just put on that little mask and people won't mm-hmm. recognize you like that is good that's good i agree with that and i like their little scene together too like as much as i don't like him saying like he quit and he doesn't want to do it i, I thought they had a nice scene together to talk about the responsibility to talk about things uh, i did like that but but also why is she not freaking out i keep <laughs> i keep going back to that why do these actors and these movies not freak out when they're you know in front of something absolutely totally fantastical life-changing oh my god they just kind of get on with it right yeah. and uh it, that fucking drives me crazy in movies like this i, I don't it's just a, my own thing there's only one other performer I think we should just briefly mention because I'd say it's the other good performance. But this is this is entirely based on just when you have an actor who can't give a bad performance. Mm, yeah, yeah. So even if they're like in a, a thankless role. <laughs> so this is our first like, uh, you know, uh, on screen Amanda Waller. And it's the mm-hmm. great Angela Bassett. And Angela Bassett just always rules. And like when she walks into this movie, she just has so much gravitas that it's like, 
Oh yeah, it's like, like you said how you, you mentioned before about how this at least feels like a real movie. That's definitely true in any scene she's in because mm-hmm. she just like classes it up big time. And like I mean, obviously I, I love uh, Viola Davis as um, as Amanda Waller now, but like they're two they're kind of just two Amanda Waller. Like this set actually feels like a much more like good Amanda Waller here. Yeah, they're not really does. playing up the um, the sinister elements of her, but like. Talk about like talk about a character that's scored with like two of the best actresses of like our modern era. <laughs> just getting it to be Angela Bassett, and then them being like, "That didn't work." Now get Viola Davis. It's like, oh man, you just can't go wrong here. But yeah, totally. she's really good in her her scenes. She's not given a lot to do, but I just wanted to highlight that she's in this because you think like this movie has Angela Bassett, Tim Robbins. Um, I'm a pretty big Peter Sarsgaard fan. You mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. Taika Waititi. This movie has a cast that kind of uh, Mark Strong. This, this movie has a cast it doesn't deserve. I mean, you got Jeffrey Rush and Michael Clark Duncan as cgi you know characters but still well and they also have kind of a director they don't deserve either like you know martin mm-hmm. campbell's a good director i mean goldeneye most people goldeneye and casino royale most people put at the very top of their all-time bond lists and the yeah. guy made made them both so yeah. this guy's no slouch either um he has a quote here about the production may i read it to you in full of course this is, this is actually obviously later on, you know, when he could talk about it more openly and his experience. So just to want to preface that. The point about Green Lantern is that whereas with Bond, I love Bond. I love the Bond films. I really enjoyed them. It was an event for me. I'm not a comic book fan. And the truth is, I never should have done the film. But I did it because I had never done a comic book film before. So I think the blame rests on my shoulders to a large extent. It was a big studio movie, and the script was not up to par. We had Ryan Reynolds, terrific, and Blake Lively. So at least those two got together. We did we did create something. The problem was I remember in the last six to eight weeks of pre-production, every day, and I mean every day, we had meetings about cutting the budget. We need to cut the budget. How are we going to cut the budget? Every goddamn day. And I'd worked out a terrific ending for that movie. I remember I had this quite uh, big office down in New Orleans, Uh, the production offices and I plastered the walls with storyboards. It was like wallpaper everywhere for the ending of the movie. And they came in and said, we can't afford it. You have to cut it all. So in the end, they came up with that crap ending, literally, because it was a big poop monster. (laughs) It's, uh, however, having said that I never should have done it, but I did it. I don't think I did a good job. So for me, for superhero movies, there are better people than me who ought to be doing those movies. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know he's taking a lot of the blame. I think he's being a little hyperbolic on the blame for him. I know when you're the director, you're the leader. I get it. Um, but I think he was kind of handed a, just a junk production, right? Like that's, yeah. I, you know, sometimes we, we, we do like to maybe pinpoint who to blame specifically. I think Martin Campbell's taking a little bit too much on his shoulders. Um, I think this was just a cluster from beginning to end. You know, from firing Berlanti right before going into production for constant script re- uh, rewrites on the day for changing that ending, um, which involved a bunch of the Guardians or sorry, a bunch of the Guardians, <laughs> a bunch of the Lanterns, you know, fighting Parallax uh, together, which would be way better. Obviously, oh, yeah. the way, way it, better. The, the, the way it works now is insane because like you said like it was supposed to be Hal, Kilowog, Sinestro and Tomar Ray uh, fighting parallax together yeah and it, they changed it to just hal fighting parallax and then like hal there's a moment like hal, so hal beats parallax by like throwing him into the sun yeah but by doing so he starts getting sucked into the sun too and suddenly like these like green tendrils come out and grab him and it makes it look like were you motherfuckers just sitting off like 10 feet away <laughs> watching this fight the whole time why didn't you help it's like the way it's filmed is like so bizarre and it's stupid because earlier sinestro takes a group of our best lanterns to go fight parallax and he beats them so then what hal the guy that doesn't even want to fucking do the job punches him into the sun and everything's fine it's just like what is this threat I don't really understand the threat. What he's, what are the motivations? What is he trying to do? And why is he so easily beat at the end here? You know, so it's a weird moment Hell. where like he, when he's like fighting Parallax and he and he's like realizes he can throw him into the sun. He has that di- he has a line of dialogue where he goes, "The bigger you are, or no, what does he say? Like the, the bigger you are, the harder you'll burn, or something. Or the no, the no, faster no, you, are, the bigger you are, the, the the faster you'll burn. That's yeah, the bigger you are, the faster you burn. And I just thought like that's that's definitely not true." <laughs> right? that, yeah, no. <laughs> nothing about that makes sense like uh, a, a small thing will burn much faster than a big yeah, thing yeah. But. 
I did like Ryan Reynolds' quote here. So he's talked a lot about this movie, as we've said, but he did say this quote, uh, this was a few years ago, uh, too much time, too much money, there was just too many people spending too much money, and when there was a problem, rather than say, okay, let's stop spending on special effects and let's think about character, how do we replace this big spectacle thing that isn't working at all with something that's character-based, And that just never happened. The thinking was never there to do that. And to their credit, it's a very old school way of looking at things. It's just, let's just keep spending our way through this. And that was, well, it didn't work. This feels like your classic Hollywood situation. Yeah, which is like, throw money at the problem. Throw money at the problem. We'll fix it. We'll fix it. We'll fix it. And then you became an all-time bomb. I'm going to say something now to to kind of, my final thought on this, and I want to see what you think of this as like a thesis statement. Sure. I actually think Green Lantern might be the first movie that was a real victim of the MCU's success. We're seeing now that the MCU is going through this, right? The MCU yeah. is experiencing the problems of what happens when you get too big and you start getting lazy and like rushing product out and trying to do so much. This movie is like the ultimate example of that because at the same time that Jeff Johns was crafting this character into a critically acclaimed book that was at the same heights as Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, right? Do you want to DC's like premier properties at the same time he's doing that in the comics, they had an opportunity to just take their time with this movie and like do the character stuff Ryan Reynolds is talking about, use the special effects to do more, you know, in a more practical way and make this like really interesting space epic. And instead, because this is coming out at the same time that phase one of MCU is going on, it's clearly like, we just got to make a Green Lantern movie. Mm -hmm. so you're absolutely right that like there's no singular person to blame here this is like you can't blame ryan reynolds even though i think he was miscast because i think his heart was probably the right place yep you can't blame martin campbell he was just out of his element can't blame the rest of the cast can't blame any of the sing like all those writers like not one of them is going to be the one that's like the most responsible for this Mm -hmm. the problem is this is like a hodgepodge of everything it's the studio saying we have to get a green lantern movie out right now because people are into superhero movies uh just what's that one that's really that's selling really well right now green lantern okay that's the one go make that movie and get (laughs) it out by this date you know and that's what happened and so this could have been you know this could have been something special i mean obviously it's true a lot of the movies we look at but if they had just taken a little bit more time and not been worried about like ah get this out before avengers which is probably what they were thinking you know maybe this would have been something but instead it's just like no no no, just make another one of those people like those and that's what they did because like you said this is just this movie could be called Superhero 101. Like it just, mm-hmm. it's just a, it's just a, the ultimate generic superhero movie at the time when that was no longer enough. At the same exact time that that genre is being revolutionized forever, they made a, an old school generic <laughs> number by the numbers superhero movie. Well, Trev, they do start to plan better because they announce after this movie is done uh, uh, that they're going to start a new universe, the DC Extended Universe with Man of Steel. So they start to plan these movies, quote unquote, better. And all the way back in July of 2015, they announce a new Green Lantern solo film called Green Lantern Core. This is, uh, if, if we if we all remember correctly, this is that like big um, press conference one, right? Where they listed like 15 films, right? I probably, yeah, I've lost and, track of all this now, but. <laughs> yeah. And that one was scheduled to come out June 19th, 2020. Um we're going to talk about two films uh, firmly in that DC Extended Universe coming up. But this entire Warner Brothers DC effort has been just a complete... Oh, man. Like, disaster. I don't even know if it really does the the job justice here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know? Like, at least Marvel, when they floundered, they at least... or And are floundering now. They at least figured it out there for a good 15 years. You know? Here... Going back to our first episode with of of the DCPU with with Supergirl and here it's just constant, constant fumbling the bag, even so much as canceling that Green Lantern Corps movie, <laughs> and say, oh, we're gonna make a TV show, uh, called Lanterns, ten hours, one hour each, episodic, uh, you know, it's gonna premiere on HBO Max. Greg Berlanti's involved, his whole production company, and guess what? Canceled. <laughs> Yeah, you could tell they, they were, and at the same time, they were even floundering with that character. So at the same time, Greg Berlanti is working on that. He's, we just mentioned earlier, he is also doing the Arrowverse, right? When, it, when Arrow ends, Arrow's like a best friend in that show, Diggle, uh, who is a superhero, who has a superhero identity, Spartan. The, the end of that show, Arrow ends with like him finding 
because he's a very heroic character, right? Ends with him finding a box like that comes to Earth, and he opens mm-hmm. the box, and there's something glowing in it, and it's green. <laughs> And everyone gets really excited because there'd actually been this like fan theory percolating for a while. Like, wouldn't it be cool if in the Arrowverse Diggle becomes Green Lantern? Because like he's not John Stewart, but he seems very John Stewart esque, you know. Mm-hmm. And then they then they said then they start making this Lantern show, and everyone of course starts going, "Oh, I wonder if Diggle they show Diggle get a ring at the end of Arrow. I wonder if he'll be in that show, and this will be a part of the Arrowverse." And then later in Superman and Lois, the next time Diggle shows up, they go like, "What happened to that like ring?" He's like, "I decided I didn't want it." <laughs> you can just tell. You can just tell like someone at DC like came down and said like, "No, no, no, you actually can't do that. You can't have him be that character." So it's like, again, they just don't know what they're doing, right? Like we said, like this whole time they could have been figuring this all and streamlining it. Even still, they're just like it's a clusterfuck. So it's crazy to think that they still can't get Green Lantern off. Uh, get him off. <laughs> uh, they can't That's get Blake it. Lively's job. And yours going back to that sock. Um, <laughs> oh, the the we they can't get it off the ground, um, and especially in a post Guardians of the Galaxy world. Yeah, that's that's I think the most shocking to me. And I know James Gunn runs DC now, and I mean we'll we'll see what happens with this new incarnation. I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about it in the next couple a couple episodes here. But mm-hmm. why is this one so hard? You know, like like we've proven that 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 audiences will show up for fun, kooky, weird characters in space. Uh, people love a space opera. They love their special effects. Uh, they like a heroic person in charge. Uh, why is this one seemingly so like the puzzle, the Green Lantern puzzle just cannot be put together. It just can't yeah, be done. I- there's like a time where I would have answered that. And I would have said, well, I kind of get it, Chris, because it's not with Green Lantern. The problem is it's not just a superhero movie. It's also a sci-fi movie, mm-hmm. right? It's it's space opera meets superhero. So that makes it more complicated. But you just nailed it. That should not be a problem anymore in a post-Guardians of the Galaxy world. Like that's the movie that showed the template. And in fact, I remember... I remember walking out of the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie and, you know, obviously raving about having many, many positive things to say about it, but saying Mm. to friends, that's the movie Green Lantern should have been, you know, maybe it was just a little less of a sense of humor. Like, I don't think Green Lantern should be that comedic necessarily, but it should look like that. That's the, that's the visual look of the movie and that's the sense of adventure. And that's like the epic space story that a Green Lantern movie should be Mm. like, so you talked about James Gunn now running DC he has announced Green Lantern involved projects. He's in, they are doing a Green Lantern show uh, that's supposed to be like a true detective type show with, I believe, Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart together on Earth investigating a crime. And like, I hear that already. I'm like, really? Like, you're going to do an Earth based <laughs> like detective show with them? Like, I'm not like not saying I won't give it a shot or won't say I won't wait to see what a trailer looks like. But I don't know. You're kind of already missing the point again. But to bring a lot of the, but to bring this full circle, I tease this at the uh, at the beginning. He's doing his Superman legacy movie. And Chris, mm-hmm. I think you probably have seen this and know this. Yeah. Nathan Fillion has been cast in that movie as a Green Lantern, but not Hal Jordan. He's been cast as Guy Gardner, a different Green Lantern. Right. And that's actually interesting. And that's like, it's kind of funny because that tells you how much someone's persona can change over time. Because I actually think it makes sense. People who read the comics will know what I mean. It very much makes sense for me to be like, a 2011 Nathan Fillion, everyone wants him to play Hal Jordan, and a 2023 Nathan Fillion, everyone would be like, he should be Guy Gardner. That actually <laughs> makes perfect sense, just because I think we know Nathan Fillion a bit more now, and realize that he's like more comedic, yeah, and he can play like the the dipshit idiot asshole part a little bit better and that's what Guy Gardner is. Like Guy Gardner is heroic, obviously because he's a Lantern, but he's like he's the he's the jock uh, douchebag Green Lantern basically, right. right. And you just think of like the character Fillion played in Guardians Three, you know, like make that a Green Lantern. That's kind of what's gonna be. So, but I'm happy he finally gets to put the ring on at least. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with this uh, this property. Like I I think that there's a lot um, there's a lot to be done with it, and and it does yeah. it does uh, hit me in things that I like. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I love this space opera shit, you know? Like, this is the stuff that I, I, I go to the movies for. So, I'm not opposed to it. Um, Maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. They, they just got to get their shit together. <laughs> this yeah. is so strange. And I mean, they honestly, get like, anybody who's working on this character, they should still be looking. I still say, look it back at that, that Jeff Johns run. That should yeah. still be your template. You know, DC has kept it in publication. It's, I believe it's, like, now you can get, like, four hardcover omnibuses just called, like, Jeff Johns' Green Lantern. And it's like, there you go. You have like a multi-year epic story 
that could be made into like a trilogy of films because he that was all his his even his run was like kind of like set up as like there was a big story at the beginning there's a big story in the middle and then there's a big story at the end it's like mm-hmm. you have your template you have the pieces what's going on here but the reputation of this movie and Ryan Reynolds constantly reminding people it's bad probably isn't helping anything, you know. So it, it, that that's got to be a huge problem about it too, eh? Like um, mm. every time they mention the words Green Lantern, it has just a huge stink. The stink yeah. is followed for a decade and plus. Yeah. So there was. A, did you see that uh, report that uh, Zack Snyder said something in 2021 about um, his version oh. of uh, in in uh, there was there was going to be a what was it an, just an idea in Justice yeah. League. That uh, the Green Lantern Corps would show up and Ryan Reynolds would cameo. Yeah, yeah. I like that Zack Snyder said that, and then he also said uh, he had never spoken to Ryan Reynolds about that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what amount of money do you think gets Ryan Reynolds in that CGI costume again? Oh, I think he would do it in a second. Actually, I think. Like, oh, you say starts... you really? I would say I would yeah. say because he he's he got more money than God at this point. Um, I didn't think he'd ever do it. You, you really I think, think he so? would do it? No, I think he would do it because of the joke of it. I think that's like to him. I think he would think it would be funny to say I'm playing Green Lantern again. I, I think that's like all that matters for him. But, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. But nobody wants to see it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, that's all I got to say about Green Lantern. Yeah. Um, no. This is my. This was my first time seeing it since the theater, and same. I will never watch it again. No. This, this, no. These two times were enough. Yeah. yeah. No. Uh, next episode, we will be firmly in the DC Extended Universe, uh, starting with, well, Black Adam, uh, mm-hmm. The Rock's our uh, old masterpiece. Buddy. Our, yes. our old buddy, The Rock. If you want a precursor to that one, go listen to Baywatch episode. That's a fun one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we're going to finish off the DCPU with The Flash. So that'll yeah. be good too. Uh, follow along at F2F pod. That's at F2, the number two F pod. Uh, that's on all the socials. So like us there, like us everywhere. Uh, rate review, whatever you do. Star rating will be cool. And just join the tribe, hit that subscribe and uh, keep on with us uh, with the DCPU. Um, we had a, uh, this, this, it's been a fun ride. Like, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I, I don't think this movie's good uh, as I think the world thinks as well. But uh it's been an interesting historical uh, adventure going on with it with with uh, Warner Brothers. Hey, wouldn't you say it's a? Uh, they keep fucking it up. <laughs> I don't understand. They, I don't understand. What was Chris? What I just wanted. What was up with Hollywood's obsession with like cloud monsters around this time too? Like you, you keep talking about Parallax being a poop monster, and that's not what he is in the comics. He's like this like yellow insectoid looking demon kind of thing in the comics and then mm-hmm. they just turn him into like a cloud here of course galactus is a cloud and rise, rise of the silver surfer why why is hollywood so obsessed with clouds evil clouds well i i remember at the time was this tom rothman was saying he didn't he didn't want any purple robots in in movies and stuff so everything mm-hmm. became that but it is strange that so close in time we got two big cloud monsters that chase our heroes through a big metropolitan city <laughs> This one really does, like, man, he's got the yellow in there. It just looks like poop logs with corn in it. It's yes. not great. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I also, going back to how easy he was to be thrown into the uh, the sun, mm-hmm. um, I did like when he, when Parallax is attacking Hal and Carol in that warehouse. And, you know, we've seen him be able to, like, suck out the soul of everybody he comes into contact. Uh, but then she shoots some missiles at him. And yeah, uh, he's like, oh, I, I gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> it just leaves. <laughs> so dumb. <laughs>